in the healthcare industry. Uh, you may have noticed outside, we have the booth. We are the ones doing the, uh, the tablet giveaways today. So at the end of this, at the end of Scott's session, we'll be giving away two tablets. So hopefully you put your business card out there. Um, but now a little bit more about Scott. Um, you guys, many of you know him, CIO of Memorial Care Health, uh, co-founder of uh, Chief, the uh, CIO info sharing group. Uh, he has taught uh, healthcare IT at California State University, Long Beach, and USC. And many of you may not know, he uh, also practiced as a clinical pharmacist. So, for further ado, here's Scott Jocelyn. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank everybody for staying. I know it's kind of late in the afternoon, and um, you could probably do other things. I think, as somebody said earlier, we have these bandwidth challenges. I know we have tons and tons and tons of stuff to do, and it's really hard to find time to do something like this. So thank you very much for staying and for being with us all day. I'd like to, um, I know they'll be at the end, but acknowledge um, Scott Sabula and Steve Edison and Angela Rivera and others who worked tirelessly on getting this ready. They literally did start after last year's event. And this is a wonderful venue. Uh, I'd like to give them a round of applause for uh, all the work that they did. And to thank the, um, the, the people here, the vendors and others who are sponsoring this. And I don't know if I disagree with, but I sort of, I, I don't mind calling my vendors partners. I think they are in many ways partners. Um, we work with them very closely, so sort of have a slightly different point of view of the people we work with all day long. Um, this is a wonderful venue. Um, I thought though when I was sitting down in the audience looking up here, I wasn't dressed appropriately, I don't have a tie on. I'm standing in front of, I think, 10 or 12 flags of the United States. I thought I should have a uniform or something <laughs> on, but um, I don't. Um, this is a wonderful venue, and I think that's contributed to the success of the, of the program. I, um, I changed the panel up from what I thought it was going to be or what we originally had in mind. Instead of having the speakers again up here talking a little bit about what they've done, you had a chance to ask them some questions. So I asked some of my fellow CIOs um, and my CMIO, Dr. Harris Stutman, to um, um, actually offer some points of view that they might have and give you a chance to ask them some questions as well. And this is entirely up to you. I have a couple of prepared questions, but this is really um, intended to be very interactive. And when we're done, we're done. We can spend a little more time relaxing. But um, I thought it would be better to uh, offer some additional points of view. So uh, to my immediate right is uh, Tim Moore, uh, a friend of mine. He's, been, he's the CIO for uh, Hogue Memorial Presbyterian. Presbyterian. St. Joe's, this is the large organization. <laughs> uh, very accomplished uh, CIO. Next to him, Cindy Peterson, the CIO for Henry Mayo Newhall. I'll let them say a couple of things about their organization, but I think many of you already know them. And to her right, um, Harris Stutman, who I've had the privilege and pleasure of working with for yeah. uh, 20 years, I know, a long time. <laughs> uh, he and I put in the TDS system at Long Beach Memorial more than 20 years ago. So we worked together um, and had a good time doing all kinds of stuff um, there. And he brings a very interesting perspective. He's worked in the vendor community. Obviously, he's practiced medicine as well. So what I asked each of them to think about, and I thought I'd kick this off with, is, is to each, each of them tell us one hope they have for uh, health care reform in our industry and also one fear um, that they have. Um, I think we have a lot of things to be fearful of, a lot of things to worry about, but one in particular uh, that might be the basis for some, uh, might stimulate some discussion or some follow-on questions. So I'll start with Tim um, with a, um, a hope and a fear. Uh, yeah, great questions. Uh, it, quite simple for me. The great hope is, is that we could actually do a covered California for health care. It's a apolitical statement, but I, I would like to believe in the professions that we're in and the time that we're in this profession, we could actually do that. And I think it's a real possibility. The fear is we get derailed over privacy issues. I think that uh, Bill talked about it a little bit earlier today. There's a, you know, there is a very vocal minority out there. But if you talk to the folks that you interact with daily and say under the right circumstances, with the right security, for the right purpose, would you like your information shared? It's almost unanimous yes. 
And my fear is, is that vocal minority is going to derail it. Are you done? <laughs> well, for me, I guess um, my hope is that we're really able to take technology to a point of being able to utilize it the way other industries utilize it. Um, that we, we aren't, and I'll say derailed like um, Tim did, we aren't derailed by all of the regulations and everything, and we're only focused on those um, initiatives instead of just focusing on the innovative. Um, we all have great minds, we all have great ideas, um, but we're unable to implement a lot of those because of the focus on projects that are regulatory or required for us. So. <laughs> Thank you, Kara. Only Kara would. Yes. Yeah, my fear is not being able to complete all of those. <laughs> so, from a from a more of a fear perspective, I guess I would say that um, privacy and security is a fear. Um, security that. We take the limited resources that we have and we're unable to um, put those where we need to relating to security. Um, you know, at times our budgets get cut, you know, and um, we have limited resources to really, I think, um, put um, relating to the security and privacy that are needed. So I, I'm with you. It's those components. Now it's your turn. It's my turn. It's your turn. So uh, I wandered into this room thinking I was going to enjoy a, a nice afternoon and learn a lot of things. And then, of course, my boss walks up and says, how would you? In any case, it was an offer I couldn't refuse. Re really, I couldn't, <laughs> refuse, I couldn't refuse. In any case, um, the, the greatest hope I have is that something that I think many of you have read about uh, and thought about called a learning healthcare system can, can actually come into being. You know, a capability uh, described in one, one recent IOM publication, uh, the digital infrastructure for a learning healthcare system. Uh, Chuck Friedman at the University of Michigan has written a lot about this, uh, formerly at, at the ONC, of course, uh, about the, the possibility that even as our clinicians and, and others do their daily work, um, uh, enter information into an electronic health record repository uh, that we uh, are smart enough and can can think presciently enough to really build the infrastructure so that that information uh, gets sort of automatically or, or seamlessly uh, aggregated, analyzed, and then fed back uh, into the very health care that we're delivering. Uh, I think it's a, it's a reasonable thing uh, that given modern computing power uh, and some really very smart people that we can deliver hopefully sometime within this decade, and I, cer I certainly hope that that comes into being. Um, there are some, uh, as you I'm sure know, some early efforts, the uh, Dartmouth Collaborative and others, in, in really trying to do that, not yet real time, but maybe we'll get there. Uh, the biggest fear I have, and th there are actually two things that kind of come together, so ho hopefully you'll, you'll bear with me. Um, most of the complaints that I get uh, from the several thousand physicians that I, uh, that I represent in my role at Memorial Care really have to do with uh, how they need to interact with the electronic health record, the boxes they need to click, the documentation that they need to provide for what seems to them and frankly what seems to me to be not much or maybe no value add. Uh, and that's entirely related to the way that we've somehow structured uh, the system of paying for health care. Uh, in the United States. Uh, there's been obviously a lot of talk about how we could change that uh, and the Affordable Care Act is a, is a step uh, in uh, I think a good direction. I'm not sure it's entirely the right direction, but, but certainly it's a direction uh, other than standing still and, and waiting for something good to happen with a payment system that somehow is designed to pay physicians and other caregivers pretty much the same way we pay seamstresses. You know, how many blouses did you make today? And I'll pay you for, you know, $2 per blouse, or how many uh, uh, visits did you do, or how many appendixes did you take out, and I'll pay you on the same basis. There's got to be, obviously, a very different way uh, for us to uh, organize our healthcare system 
and hopefully we're moving in the right direction, accountable care, value-based purchasing and the like, uh, but I have a lot of fears given um, sort of the way things tend to work at, at this country at the highest decision-making levels that we're going to deliver on that really major requirement. We'll see. Great. Thank you. You know, I was wondering, um, Mike Murphy listed a number of strategic items that Sharp was pursuing. And I think the notion that strategy is really about choices, um, choices of things that we're going to do, um, and making choices about what not to do. And I think with bandwidth and, as Cindy points out, resource challenges and so on, we're all faced with making choices related to our organization's strategies, but also the underlying IT components. And I was going to ask uh, anyone on the panel what they might volunteer in terms of what they're choosing not to do. With all the things they have in front of you right now, and maybe you'd like to do it, maybe you should do it, um, but maybe you can't do it, but, but maybe you're consciously choosing to ignore or not do one thing either because it's not ready or there's other things just ahead of it. So I was wondering what you're choosing not to do. And I think some of the folks out here selling products and services would like to know what we're not going to be putting in next week that we just have to wait for some period of time. Any thoughts? Well, I'll start. As Go as, ahead. As long as you guys <laughs> jump in. So I, I think one thing that I, I'm pretty sure we're not doing, unless Scott tells me tomorrow that we're doing it, um, is, is moving to a different mechanism of delivering health care, uh, using you know, telehealth, virtual visits, uh, the kinds of things that, that I think, you know, as we heard earlier, you know, could, could well move the ball forward, really providing access uh, in a lot, a lot of different venues and a lot of different ways. Um, that um, I think can deliver a lot of value uh, for uh, at a much greater convenience than we than we currently have available to us, where we have to think constantly in terms of bricks and mortar and and moving people in and out of of waiting rooms and facilities and that sort of thing. Um, because of all the other uh, things that we do have on our agenda, I don't see that we're going to be able to get to that. In addition to the to the fear that I mentioned before, which is that we're not exactly sure how we're going to get paid for doing those sorts of things in, in the uh, months and years ahead. Okay, for us what we're not doing is we're not looking for another um, full HIS system. Um, we're looking at optimizing the system that we have and utilizing that wherever possible. Um, we're not looking at um, new vendors um, particularly we're trying to find ways to maximize what we have and yet utilize some technologies out there to help with the communications. Um, we're not looking at um, replacing our hardware every three years. You know, we're, we're looking at how long can the hardware continue to be there. You know, um, not necessarily carrying maintenance on some of our hardware if we think that you know, we could carry just another piece in our inventory and be able to utilize that. So, um, so trying to maximize, I think, what we have is our, our biggest focus and not trying to, to replace just to replace. I, I really like what you just said there uh, on the hardware. That's, um, if you think about it, you think about our cars, right? You know, our, our cars used to have a shelf life, of, and we thought really highly of them if they made 70,000, 80,000 miles. You know, today our new cars don't even get broke in until 100,000 miles, yet we're still using the algorithms for hardware replacement that literally from the 70s. Um, you know, more and more I, I stress my folks out as to why do we need to replace that? What is the differentiator? What's happening? What happens if it does fail? What, what then? Um, but that isn't what I was going to put, but I love what you said with that. Um, I, I would say the things in generic terms are the nice-to-haves are going away. All right. Even at even at Hogue, many I get teased by a lot of the folks that know us well. You know, they think that Hogue just has it all. Um, even at Hogue, um, the nice to haves are going away. Um, and then, in addition to that, uh, the last thing I want to have is yet another BI solution, a standalone BI solution. I was the brave person that put my hand up and said eh, five, and then I was just talking to Bill Russell a moment ago. We were kind of being honest with each other. We'd probably seven or eight um, each. There's just so much of that. That doesn't help. That doesn't help the different size wheels that Bill was talking about. Um, and then our investments that we're, we are making, and we're making more and more of them, and I, I, I assume most, if not all of you are, is we're moving away from that acute care setting 
into the community settings and how do we make sure we're managing those transition of care, making the dollar bets around that. So questions from the audience, this is your chance. Questions? Oh, come on. I have one mic now, I will call so on my friends. <laughs> Sorry, is there one? Ah, back here. Thank you. Is this okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Amy Walker, I have a question about the EMR, EHR certification um, system that's been set up as a result of Meaningful Use and ONC. How, have you found that of value? I want to be careful how I ask the question, but have you found that that process has added value to your IT solutions? Safe enough? Fair enough. Let me, I'll just give it a very simple answer. Most definitely, uh, but maybe a little different than you're asking it. So, you know, Hogue has a community, HIE, that it's a private, but we share it with the community. And, you know, our strategy is to connect any, any vendor out there as long as they're certified. And the first place we go is to make sure they're certified. Um, and if they're not, we're, we're done until they can get to that point. That's one use. I think when we are looking at vendors, um, the certification is important, and it, it's an element, um, you know, on the evaluation process. Um, I think it has also taken vendors to a next level. Um, I think it's it's added elements that they probably wouldn't have added within their product unless they were required to add add those. Um, so I think it has um, stepped up their game. Um, and it's probably made their product better. So I guess it's up to me to take the contrary view. Uh, so the contrary view is spoken from, uh, on behalf of an organization that's, that's a, on the operational side uh, for revenue cycle, HIM, and clinicals is a single vendor shop. Um, and in that context, uh, we were very happy when uh, we made, we thought we were making the right decision 10 years ago? Yeah, my God, nine, nine or 10 years ago. Um, and uh, I think we would have made the same decision uh, in 2013 as well. We've been very happy about how uh, things have progressed with, with our vendor. Uh, on the other hand, it certainly seems like over the last two or three or four years that more and more and more of the development cycles uh, are related to what they need to do to maintain the certification status of each release uh, and the, the newer, newer uh, uh, meaningful use objectives uh, that come out that obviously the certification criteria uh, match up with. Uh, and that, that has some frustrations. It actually has, I think, a lot of frustrations. Uh, a lot of the things that, that are get, getting built because of meaningful use are things that probably will add value. They may not necessarily have been things that we would have uh, prioritized for their uh, development efforts, uh, but um, uh, it's certainly been a, a mixed, mixed bag at best. Yeah, I, I guess I'll add an opinion to that too. I would agree, agree with Harris. I think it's, it's been helpful. I think it's the right thing to do. I think meaningful use, generally speaking, is a good thing, moving us in the right direction. But we are losing cycles, the development. I mean, even the very, very capable, strong vendors are spending an inordinate amount of time chasing that. And yet, we don't have really have the plug and play environment we'd like to have. We talk about interoperability. We have HIEs and all the rest. And yes, we'll be able to exchange